afternoon. I want to thank all of the elected officials, their representatives who have joined us here today, but most importantly, you, because as you will see, this state of the district is actually about you. I'm your council member, Ben Kalos, had the privilege of representing the Upper East Side, Midtown East, Sutton area, El Barrio, and Roosevelt Island over the last 24 months, nine days, and uh, 40 minutes. <laughs> Today I'll report on what we've been able to accomplish in such a short time period and a plan for what we can get done together in the remaining one year, 11 months, 21 days, 10 hours, and 19 minutes and 23 seconds uh, that we have remaining in my first term. As a constituent and advocate myself, then candidate and now council member, I've always been frustrated with how government can be opaque, closed, unaccountable, and broken. What if we started to change all that, empowering our community? What would that look like? I opened my office as your office, a community center where I invite you to join me in person for Thursday Friday of each month from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., policy night at 6 p.m. on the second Tuesday of each month for you to organize and shape public policy. Free legal clinics provide free housing, family law, and domestic violence counseling each month. Monthly mobile office hours at senior centers and NYCHA to bring our office to you. Each evening, I or my staff attend community board, precinct council, neighborhood association, and tenants association meetings. Over the warmer months, you'll find us at street fairs or cooking with Kalos at your green markets. But all of that involves you coming to meet us, so we've launched Ben in your building, where if you can gather 10 neighbors, I'll come to you and meet with you in your home or lobby to discuss whatever's important to you. Yes, I make house calls. Thank you to Elspeth Ryman, Daniel Dornbaum, and Danny Caton, who join me each and every month for First Friday and Policy Night. Their support and regular contributions make my job fulfilling and more effective. We've had nearly two dozen First Fridays and Policy Nights. My constituent service team, led by Debbie Lightbody, with support from Tirso Tavares, and roughly a dozen graduate students in social work have helped more than four thousand constituent service cases. Our legal clinics have provided individual counseling to nearly 250 of our neighbors who are trying to stay in their homes or get heat back in their apartments. And I've made a dozen house calls through Ben in your building. Ultimately, my goal is to personally meet all 168,413 people who live in my district in order to better serve and work with them to find affordable housing or get that 301 complaint resolved or work together to draft and pass a law that will make our city better. Please stop by my office and let us know how we can help. Most of our most substantial and pressing constituent service is around housing issues. From poor conditions to evictions, we're here to help individuals and protect housing in our neighborhood. I grew up here. I want to raise a family here, and I want to grow old here, too. We must protect our affordable housing and public housing and combat the forces of overdevelopment. Our affordable housing crisis is forcing people from their homes and onto the streets. As of Christmas, we had 23,416 children who woke up in our shelters with 17,071 parents and 12,845 single adults leaving 3,100 people still on our streets. When you see someone who is homeless or panhandling on the street, please don't give them money, but call or use the 301 app to report it so we can send an outreach team to offer them three meals a day and a roof overhead. 301 will let you know the results of their outreach. Even if the person says no, if you keep calling, each interaction helps build a relationship that gets them closer to saying yes to our help. The development booms threatens rent-stabilized and affordable housing. We have fought to preserve the affordability and character of our neighborhoods. When the mayor's housing plan called for adding height to the contextual height caps that allow for the east side's quiet side streets, we opposed the measure with Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer and Senator Liz Kruger so developers wouldn't tear down 
rent stabilized buildings to get more height. And the Department of City Planning heard us and agreed to protect the mid block. With Civitas Chair Philippe Ventegit and then Executive Director Emma Bologna, we've continued to address the Mayor's housing plan, ensuring that historic districts remain protected and mandatory inclusionary housing provides housing to keep our middle class from being squeezed out. This city must remain affordable for all New Yorkers. The Upper East Side has a long history of rent stabilization, and after two years of ardent advocacy along tenant leaders, we won a rent freeze. There's overdevelopment, and then there's super scrapers. When residents of the Sutton area, including Sutton area community president Dieter Selig, alerted my office to a proposed 90-story building for billionaires, we worked with local residents to form the East River 50s Alliance. Under the leadership of President Alan Kirsch, the Alliance has worked with us to organize the community behind an effort to rezone the neighborhood, to draw the line on Billionaire Row at residential neighborhoods. Integral to this community effort are Herndon Worth, the Sage of Sutton, and Charles Fernandez, who have rejected buyouts and resisted harassments and stayed in their apartments, saying the light, air, and history of our neighborhood are too important to, mo to demolish for a side sc skyscraper. And they're actually here today. Preserving the history of our city this past year held special significance. Just as we marked the 50th anniversary of the Landmarks Law, it came under attack. First, with a proposal to remove hundreds of buildings from protection without review, and then with legislation that would have created a five-year moratorium, incentivizing the historic communities to be raised. Leading a coalition of over 70 preservation groups with friends of the Upper East Side Historic District's Chair Franny Eberhardt, and then Executive Director Tara Kelly, as well as Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, we persuaded the Landmarks Preservation Commission to review every proposed landmark that was on the chopping block, and we have fought off the bad legislation. <laughs> Developers have long sought to privatize our public housing, which provides a safety net for homelessness in a city that is becoming increasingly unaffordable. Now, Mayor de Blasio seeks to build luxury apartments on a playground serving children of Holmes Towers. Prior to NYCHA's announcing the Holmes as a location, I came out against the plan unless it had resident support, maximum preference for existing tenants, and 100% affordable housing. Congressmember Maloney, Manhattan Borough President Brewer, and I stand united with Holmes Towers Tenant Association President Sandra Perez against building luxury units on NYCHA playgrounds. All of these campaigns, whether they're local or citywide, are meant to address the issues that you have brought to me and my team. When Rebecca Sears, who's disabled, living in a basement walk-up apartment on the east side, applied for affordable housing, she was put on a waiting list, twice. With no information about how long the wait would be, Rebecca raised awareness of this issue by sharing her story with NBC, and I introduced a bill that would create a single universal application for all affordable housing and bring transparency to waiting lists. Landlords have received over $1 billion in tax breaks and abatements to build affordable housing, but the city currently has no way to verify affordable units were built or offered. So my bill would also require them to register with the city. A recent investigation by ProPublica found that 50,000 to 200,000 units of affordable housing are being hidden from New Yorkers. Our city is in desperate need of affordable housing and we cannot allow landlords to hide even a single unit of it from the public. Another of the most common issues I hear about from you is transportation. In my first year, when a series of traffic collisions in our neighborhood reinforced the importance of Vision Zero, 
I mailed a survey to 60,000 households asking for your feedback on improving our streets. We compiled your responses into a report on livable streets, highlighting our most dangerous intersections and proposing street improvements throughout the neighborhood. The Department of Transportation's Manhattan Pedestrian Safety Plan prioritized seven of our most dangerous intersections, and we we're already starting to see repavings, medians, neck downs, and other safety improvements on 1st, 2nd, and 3rd avenues. Please continue to report dangerous intersections and corners to my office so we can all have livable streets. In addition to making our transportation infrastructure safer, I've been focused on improving the behavior of those using our streets to better share them safely. First, we took on commercial cycling. If you order food at home, which all of us do, a commercial cyclist has delivered it. We've gone to every restaurant in the neighborhood two years in a row to offer free vests, lights, and bells in exchange for participating in a training on cycling safety. We've also changed 311 so you can report commercial cyclists without vests, and we secured a commitment from DOT to send an inspector in response to your calls. You should see more vests now and are empowered to be my eyes and ears in the community to report specific restaurants whose cyclists are not obeying the law. I've also asked every building that has hosted a Ben in your building to ban commercial cyclists from delivering food on electric bikes or without a vest, which is the same way we eliminated menus from being slid under our doors. This past summer, we launched a bike safety program to ensure the safety of pedestrians, motorists, and cyclists alike. I partnered with DOT, the NYPD, City Bike, Transportation Alternatives, and Bike New York uh, with Sharon Pope to distribute safety materials and safety equipment such as bells, lights, and helmets, train cyclists on safe practices and the rules of the road in schools and when they buy new bikes, and increase education and enforcement against unsafe behavior. And we got results. The 19th Precinct stepped up enforcement 52%, distributed safety material to over 8,000 cyclists, resulting in 18% fewer bike and physical vehicle collisions and 15% lower bike pedestrian collisions. <laughs> this summer also saw City Bike expand to the Upper East Side. Thank you to hundreds of people who provided feedback online and in person at several community forums. Through your hard work, we were able to move multiple locations, including at 72nd Street and 84th Streets. City bikes are already the safest vehicles on the road, not a single death, and only 10.5 collisions per million trips as compared to 1,121 fatal car crashes in New York in 2013 alone. But I wanted them to be safer, and City Bike has agreed to ride a monthly 90-minute bike safety class at my office that provide part provides participants with a free day pass or a month on an annual membership. I also introduced legislation to improve hazardous sidewalk conditions and fix crumbling curb cuts to ensure 889,219 New Yorkers with disabilities and nearly 1 million residents 65 or older can navigate the streets safely. Safety is first but improving our commute is the purpose of all this work. Long advocated for expanded East River Ferry Service, and I'm proud that the city has approved new stops for Roosevelt Island in 2017, <laughs> as well as 62nd and 90th Streets by 2018, utilizing our waterfronts to improve commutes. Select I can tell where the different parts of the neighborhood are sitting based on the <laughs> applause. Select bus service has brought off-board fare payment to the M86 following my advocacy to improve crosstown service. The block-long lines we all know too well should be a thing of the past that buses get 20% faster. And I continue to advocate for expansion of select bus service to other crosstown buses, including the M79. That time saved translates into revenue for businesses whose taxes help pay for further transit improvements, a virtuous cycle. Being trapped in the subway without a lifeline is now a part of the past, following my advocacy for mobile service and free Wi-Fi in subways. I'm happy to announce the service at 86th Street and stops along Lexington Avenue. The 2nd Avenue subway construction last started nearly a decade ago. 
Since then, I've joined Congress member Carolyn Maloney at regular meetings and press conferences to hold the MTA accountable so that they will finish on time in 2016. And we remain on track for completion by then, and we are currently fighting the MTA's decision to stall work on phase two of the construction into East Harlem. This summer, City Hall proposed limiting the number of Ubers, unfairly targeting innovation and making it harder for New Yorkers to get where we're going. I came out against and helped defeat this plan. Government should embrace innovation from private sector and pass an NYC eCal app that will allow any New Yorker to hail all 19,000 of our trusted yellow and green taxis. This year, I continue to tour our local schools, now made it to nearly every public school in the district to meet with principals, teachers, students, and parents. I hope to revisit every school each year, as this has been a valuable way to get to know each school and address its needs. We've opened two new schools in the district this year, the Icon Preschool with the goal of inspiring young children to become scientists, and the Trevor Day School with a new building on 95th Street. I'm especially proud to have worked with allies like Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito and public advocate Tish James to negotiate major gains for public education and to this city's budget. $12.7 million for renewal schools that will offer city services and support for families and children who need it most. $1.14 million to hire 80 more crossing guards so students can cross the street safer. And $17.9 million for breakfast after the bell to fight hunger for 339,000 children at 530 elementary schools in the city. But more has, to be fun, more has to be done to fight child hunger. I introduced a bill requiring schools to report on their school breakfast use rates and efforts, which would get us one step closer in our fight to get universal breakfast after the bell. Only 35% of students who eat free school lunch also eat school breakfast. Here in the district, I've invested over $5 million in discretionary funding to support STEM education in our local public schools. My office worked with Eva Bosbach, coordinator of the Roosevelt Island Parents Network and the Department of Education to open additional pre-K seats on Roosevelt Island. The five and six-year-olds in Paula Raghavan's class at PS290 were only just out of pre-K but that didn't stop them from pitching me on legislation. The kids asked me to write a bill banning toxic pesticides in our city's parks, allowing only natural pesticides. And when the bill was ready to be introduced in the council, we announced it together for the press in the playground on the heels of the World Health Organization's announcement that certain toxic pesticides were carcinogens. We've continued the annual public school art show featuring students' work at Sotheby's. Thank you to PS183 Principal Tara Napoleone, Art Director Wang Ling Farr, and Parent Patricia Courage for leading the effort, and to the students from PS183, PS77, PS290, PS151, Vanguard High School, PS169, PS6, PS527, MS177 who participated. Creativity must be nurtured in our schools by promoting the arts. Each year, residents in my district, ages 14 <laughs> older, get to vote on how to spend $1 million in the community. The ballot is decided, and the process is run by residents like you who volunteer as delegates. Last year, our top vote getters were new green roofs for PS 151 and PSIS 217 on Roosevelt Island. Thank you and congratulations to Principals Samantha Kaplan and Mondana Beckman, PTA Presidents Nestle Sinner, Michael Rawlinger, and Olga Shuchinov, and on Roosevelt Island, Girl Scout Troops 3244 and 3245, led by Janine Schaefer, and the Brownies of Girl Scout 3001, led by Aisha Yelusizov, of all of whom worked together to develop and gain support for their perspective projects. Okay, now you can go. In our first year, we had over 600 votes. Last year, we had 2,140 votes. And this year, 
I'm hoping that you can help us reach the more than 130,000 people who live in the district so that they can vote too. Our parks will also see significant improvements starting on the East River Esplanade. When I took office, our community's tireless leader, Congressmember Carol Maloney, asked me to co-chair the East River Esplanade Task Force as the Esplanade was in desperate need of repair. In my short term in office, I've negotiated $35 million in city funding and over $9 million from Rockefeller University and $1 million from the Hospital for Special Surgery. The Esplanade will see improved landscaping with irrigation to keep it alive, new seating and lighting, designated bike lanes, and new noise barriers along the FDR Drive for a more peaceful and beautiful park from 64th to 68th and 70th to 72nd streets with maintenance and perpetuity to keep it that way. This is coupled with investment in a Friends of Conservancy founded by Jennifer Ratner, which just brought on executive director Jessica Marcelin. And we've already broken ground and see the East River Esplanade becoming a central public space for a community once again. Carl Scherz Park Playground is in line for $1.3 million renovation. And I'd like to say thank you to the children, parents, grandparents, and community members who attended community meeting to provide guidance for the Parks Department. This year saw the launch of conservancies for Rupert and Sutton Parks, thanks to Nancy Plager and Jack Barnett, respectively. These new groups join longstanding and valuable conservancies we have, the Carl Schurz and St. Catharines Parks, who protect our all too limited park space. Thank you to neighborhood associations that support our parks, including the East 60s with Judy and Barry Schneider, as well as East 79th Street with Betty Cooper Wallerstein, along with Marsha Reese, who helped bring senior fitness classes and an adult passive recreation space to John Jay Park. I hope in the next year, <laughs> I hope that in the next year, we can found conservancies for John Jay Park and Stanley Isaacs, thereby achieving my goal of having a conservancy for each and every park in the district. Please also consider adopting a planter on your block or on First Avenue, a program we've established in partnership with Sarah Gallagher and the Upper Green Side. Since before I was elected, I've been a vocal opponent of building a marine transfer station in a residential neighborhood. We continue to fight the marine transfer station and thanks to your support, here's what we've already accomplished. We've moved the ramp, one block north to protect 35,000 children from all over the city who play at Asphalt Green in partnership with Pledge to Protect and the local community. I've introduced legislation with Councilmember Dan Gorodnik to monitor air quality to protect us from pollution. I forced commitments from Commissioner Garcia under oath to limit use of the MTS to only 1,800 of the total 5,200 tons per day in capacity, keeping more than 300 garbage trucks off our streets every day. I have, advocate <laughs> I have advocated and, for, and secured funding for guardrails on garbage trucks and other large city vehicles. I advocated and won, you may remember this from the campaign, a goal of zero waste to make the marine transfer to landfill obsolete by 2030. We exposed high costs from $93 a ton to $278 a ton for a total price tag of $632 million. And we built a borough, three borough coalition against garbage dumps in residential neighborhoods. With your help, we will continue to fight this ill-conceived marine transfer station. In order to limit trash, I've co-sponsored legislation to limit the use of disposable plastic bags. And I'm distributing free reusable bags from Citizens Committee for New York City so that we can each save the planet one bag at a time. <laughs> Speaking of trash, constituents have complained for years about conditions emanating from 86th Street in Lexington. This is where 20.7 million riders use the subway each year which is similar in ridership to Penn Station at 7th Avenue. The permanent sustainable solution 
to keeping 86th Street clean is a business improvement district. My office with the leadership of Susan Gottridge as acting chair of the bid steering committee and Elaine Walsh of the East 86th Street Association and the support of local property owners is leading this push to provide funds to supplement city services with sidewalk sweeping, trash pickup, big belly solar compactors, public safety, and small business support. Thank you to Andrew Fine and his fine blog for his tireless reporting of this problem and his productive outreach to business owners to gather support for this initiative. If you want to clean up 86th Street, the best thing you can do is get every store in the neighborhood to support the bid and fill out the survey at bencalos.com slash bid. Thousands of quality of life Thousands of quality of life violations are issued to the Environmental Control Board every year for things like leaving trash in the streets, unshoveled sidewalks, construction companies working outside of hours, or not following safety regulations, and stores violating health regulations. Unfortunately, many of these fines go unpaid to the tune of $1.6 billion. I co-chaired a hearing on a package of the legislation that would allow the city to revoke licenses and permits from property owners who have unpaid debt and are repeat offenders so quality of life will improve. I have growing concerns that the city has been setting the bar too low in the mayor's management report, the annual public report card on local government that is critical to management. Unfortunately, according to my analysis, the city failed to set performance targets for more than half the time. And when it did, 35% of the time, targets were set below current performance standards, which if followed would make conditions in our city worse. At an oversight hearing I chaired on the report, we asked the administration why the report had planned for an increase in homelessness and child mortality. They agreed to work with us going forward to improve the report, and I look forward to working to get our management reporting and the city back on track. I've authored legislation and resolutions that have passed the city council and have been signed into law to improve democracy with a pro-voter pro law expansion, Local Law 63, online voter guide, Local Law 43, for transparency in government, open legislation, Resolution 184, Law Online, Local Law 37, City Record Online, Local Law 38, Open Mapping, Local Law 108, and on the topic of women's issues, a resolution in support of the National Women's History Museum, which we worked on with Congressmember Carol Maloney, who then successfully passed her own bill in Congress. A lot of my laws use technology and the internet to upgrade our government, but that isn't much use for those on the other side of the digital divide. That's why I've advocated with public advocate Tish James and Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer for affordable broadband for low-income New Yorkers as a condition to any merger with Time Warner Cable in New York City. I'm proud to announce, <laughs> I'm proud to announce that following our advocacy, the Public Service Commission has just ordered charter, which will replace Time Warner Cable to provide affordable broadband at 30 megabits for $14.99 a month to 875,601 low-income students receiving free and reduced school lunch and 174,646 seniors receiving Social Security supplemental income in New York City, over a million people. <laughs> this will be coupled with subsidized laptops for $199 and free training, which all together will help eliminate the homework gap and to go a long way towards bridging the digital divide. But the best is yet to come. As chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations, you may have already figured out that I've been focused on improving democracy, transparency, and a no wrong door approach to government as a public utility that works just like your faucet in the morning. One of the most significant steps we could take towards fulfilling this vision can be found in automatic benefits, legislation I proposed this summer that would give government benefits to everybody who qualifies automatically. No application or renewal required, using information the government already has to increase efficiency and reduce bureaucracy. My constituents, like Ken Craddock, whose nutrition benefits renewal took four appointments and nearly 16 hours of waiting on the phone, would get the help they need when they need it. 
helping us bridge the 550,000 person gap between New Yorkers who qualify for nutrition benefits and those who receive them. And that's just food. No one should go hungry, lose their home, or go without health care in one of the wealthiest cities in the world. As we work towards the ambitious goal of automatic benefits, we can help you get the benefits you're entitled to. In 25 minutes or less, we can get you qualified and screened for 25 or more government benefits at my office, or you can go online to nyc.gov slash accessnyc. It should be obvious by now that nothing we've done, we've done alone. If you're looking for one more way to get involved in the communities, please join me in my office or one of the organizations I've mentioned or apply for your local community board. I know many of our hardworking board members are in the audience today, including Community Board 8 Chair Jim Kleins. I've worked to provide support and transparency to the boards, perhaps most excitingly by passing a resolution to allow 16 and 17 year olds to serve. And I was then excited to appoint high schooler Zoe Markowitz upon the law's implementation. I'm also fighting to add urban planners to the board staffs and have published best practices for appointments. I believe this is a great time to join our most grassroots level of government, and I hope you'll pick up a form in the lobby today. Speaking of the lobby, please join us for Bagels with Ben, and please fill out your form for your picture with me in our photo receiving line. Whether or not you have a title, all of us in this room are leaders in some aspect of the neighborhood and city. Whether on the community board, your neighborhood association, your building, your PTA, or in your own home, your experience and expertise in our community can bring value to the rest of us. Thank you for your partnership, and I hope to see you over the next year as we work to make the Fifth Council District and the City of New York an even better place to live.